What is multiculturalism? How does it happen? Is it possible to find it nowadays? What's the unique spirit many cultures together can create? South Africa, a country between the Atlantic and Indian Oceans, between wealth and poverty, unspoiled beauty and vibrant cities, between a past of segregation and a present of tolerance. A population of around 50 million, nine provinces and 11 official languages. The country of Nelson Mandela, the Big Five, the 2010 World Cup, and amazing landscapes. It's also a multi-ethnic society where diverse cultures live together, creating an unparalleled multicultural heritage, a country where all South Africans are recognized as citizens of a single rainbow nation. My challenge is to understand multiculturalism, to uncover what lies beyond this word, and I will do that by meeting people from the different cultures that make up the new South Africa. Andrew Evans has been National Geographic's digital explorer since 2008. He wanders the globe in pursuit of authentic travel experiences and shares them with the world via internet and social media. First, he made his way south from Washington, D.C. to Antarctica by bus. Since then, many more countries have followed, always traveling and always wired. For Andrew, there is no new media, but only new technology. I arrive in South Africa by following the path of the early explorers. Vasco da Gama, the Portuguese explorer who commanded the first ships to sail directly from Europe to India, left Lisbon in July 1497. That December, the ships had navigated one of the longest journeys beyond the sight of land at that time. After rounding the southern tip of Africa and heading northeast, he spotted the coast on Christmas Day, hence the name Natal, birth of Christ in Portuguese. Durban definitely feels the most African of any South African city, with a complex interweaving of Zulu, Indian, and British culture. The broad cultural mix of people who have come from all corners of the globe provides such a unique spirit. Durban is a red-blooded city and it's pumping all the time. I love the view in Victoria Road where you're standing there in the street and you see a mosque, but you also see this Catholic church side by side. And then on the exact same block, you have this Indian market. And all three of these things smashed together into one street embodies the city of Durban. The fact that you have taken people from India and you have taken this European colonial background, and then all of the, the African elements of the city that are all right there. And the fact that it fits, it somehow fits together in Durban. And it probably wouldn't fit together anywhere else in the world, but somehow here it works. And it's the beauty of the city. Durban is a true African city. It has an African history, it has an African soul, and it has a very African reality today. Durban is a Zulu city. This is a city where one culture is very strong. You see the culture in a way that I haven't seen anywhere else in South Africa. In some ways, I feel that this is their unofficial capital. The Zulu are the largest ethnic group in South Africa, with an estimated 10 to 11 million people, most of whom live in this province. Historically, the Zulu were a mighty warrior nation whose fate changed at the beginning of the 19th century during the reign of King Shaka. 
He united the clans into a single powerful tribe and introduced a new system of military tactics and weaponry. This allowed them to inflict the British Army their worst ever defeat in 1879. But how do the Zulu live today? My lady, you know what you're doing. It's Marley Wright. Time now to take a look. Hands. My name is Pindi Gwile. This is Gagasi FM. The show is AM. I met Pindi by chance. Through her radio show, Pindi tries to help the community, talking about health and legal issues, career advancement, and tries to make a difference in people's lives. And all people are smiling because the weekend is just around the corner. <laughs> She wanted to show me umlazi, for me to understand the textures, the colors, the sounds, and the contrasts of a real township. Umlazi is uh, a beautiful place. It's the second biggest uh, township in South Africa. Over 1.5 million people residing here. And the beautiful thing about this place is that there's always excitement. You know, you come to this place and it is always buzzing. How did Umlazi happen? Um, Umlazi came to, uh, to being Umlazi like all the other townships in South Africa because of um, how we were placed as people in South Africa. There's always been segregation. You always will find white people residing there, you find Indian people there, you find African people there. So Umlazi is one of the townships that was, I would say, allocated for your African community to stay in. So that's how it really came about. And people have lived here for many years. Some have moved, but they still retain their houses here as their family homes. But Umlazi has changed a lot, as Pindi showed me. Since Freedom Day, hospitals, schools, and universities have been built to improve the community. And now, people are living their lives in this Durban township, as they are throughout the rest of this free South Africa. But Pindi told me that I was still lacking one main experience in Durban. She insisted that I try a typical shisanyama, like a barbecue, but grilled in the old traditional Zulu way. So what happens now is before we all start, we don't dig in all at the same time. Um, the man is considered the head of the family. So what would happen is that the man would then cut the meat, taste the meat, and the tasting is really to make sure that if there's any poison in the food, he goes first. So the rest of the family will stay on. So in this case, now that you're the man, I'd like you to do the honors. <laughs> okay. Let's start with the bottom us. Yeah. The sun sets and I let myself go in the city that never sleeps. Durban's nightlife is buzzing, famous across all of South Africa. Food, live music and fun for people enjoying this laid back city. Durban is also known for its maritime orientation. The Bay of Natal was one of the few natural harbors available along the east coast of southern Africa. The port dates back to the beginning of the 19th century, when the first European settlers made a landing with the intention of setting up a trading post. But today, Durban is home to the busiest container port in Africa but its coast also hides a secret. The Aliwal Shoal, a rocky reef which has some stunning marine life that was once rated by Jacques Cousteau as one of the top 10 dive sites in the world. 
but the shoal is best known for one particular animal, sharks. The fierce sea monster, the fish that the gods condemned to swim eternally. Nothing could prepare me for what I was going to experience here. Diving into the water over the Aliwal Shoal, diving into water filled with sharks, was at first absolutely terrifying. But then, in a split second, when you're surrounded by these sharks, and you see how beautiful they are, and you see that they're not interested in you, I had a feeling of total ecstasy. In your face, in your face. What beautiful. But I found something more than sharks there. I found a real life mermaid who has devoted her life to protecting underwater life. Judy Mann is the director of SeaWorld at Ushaka Marine World, the largest marine theme park in Africa and one of the largest aquariums in the world. The aquarium plays a vital role in the conservation of South Africa's coast, and Judy is one of the people who makes it possible. One of the programs that we have here that's really been quite interesting has been working with tiger sharks. Now, tiger sharks are really iconic species. They're amazing animals. And we've had occasions where sharks have come in to us either from fishermen or that have been caught in nets. We've had those sharks with us for a number of years. And when they get to a stage where we think they're actually just getting a little bit big for us, we'll release them out at sea. And the next year, we'll have another animal that'll come in and join us and release that one. So in that way, we're actually able to expose people. But the sharks have the opportunity to spend some time with us, and then they're back to see again. So you're a foster mom for sharks. Yeah, well, we think ourselves <laughs> like this, but we make sure they're really, really well fed while they're with us. Thirty-two tanks, 17,500 cubic meters of water, more than 10,000 animals of around 300 different species. Judy's Kingdom is one of the finest aquariums in the world that not only amuses, but also protects endangered life. I do this because I'm passionate about the marine environment. I absolutely love the oceans, I love the animals in our oceans, and my passion is really to try and communicate that love and care for our marine life to other people. Because I know that unless people know what's out there, they're not going to care for it. And that's really what drives me, is, is that love of the marine environment. And when I have the opportunity to dive with an amazing shark, or to see some tiny little animal on the reef, I just feel so incredibly privileged and I would like others to be able to experience that. And I know that not everyone can go diving. So the opportunity to experience that is here is, is phenomenal. And when I, I see people's faces and just they look at it and they go, wow, these animals are really incredible. I, I feel a, an amazing sense that this is really something worthwhile. Judy showed me the incredible underwater life of Durban, but what about the animals on the surface? What about one of the most important South African legacies? To discover it, I drove 45 minutes out of Durban, and this is where I met Divan. Divan used to be a ranger at Kruger National Park, who started professional hunting with his father when he was 10 years old. Now he protects wildlife to preserve it for future generations. How did you start working with animals? I'm a, a local boy. Um, my parents own a reserve similar to this, not far from here. And um, it was mainly for hunting purposes. And as a young boy, I was dragged along against my will with my father, telling me, you have to hunt, you have to hunt. This is what we do, this is what the family does. And then as I grew up, 
later on in life when I started using my own mind, I realized that the killing part is not for me. Looking at the animals and appreciating the animals meant more to me. When it started getting into the phase where money got involved, where the biggest trophy was shot out, regardless if it's still breeding or not, it really bugged me. And um, I decided to go the conservation route. And slowly but surely, I um, got my whole family involved, showing them that it's not necessary to actually kill animals to enjoy nature, but actually see them over and over again. And uh, pretty much two years later, I've converted my father, all my family, to conservationists instead of hunters. All you've heard about Africa, all you've read, it all becomes real when you feel the wild, when you smell the bush, when you see the colors of the sunrise surrounded by animals. How bad is the poaching situation? The poaching has escalated in the last three years to considerable numbers. Um, the poaching continues or increase um, the way it's going on now, that rhinos will be extinct in Africa in the next 10 years. That's why we constantly monitoring runners, making sure that they're safe. Um, and that is where field staff is very, uh, comes in so important um, as to training the people how to deal with these situations and preventing any um, poaching happening on the reserve. Devon stepped right out of the old adventure books that I used to read when I was a kid. He loves animals, he loves the bush, and loves being out in the wild. No one that knows him could imagine him living in a city. Devon is a very passionate person who cares deeply about wildlife and protecting and maintaining it and, in some ways, is risking his own life to protect the animals that still remain. Durban is a big city, the third largest city in South Africa, and a vibrant metropolis that has always been a point of collision of forces coming from various directions. A busy downtown where you can find the city hall, almost an exact replica of Belfast City Hall, that stands in front of office buildings where life never stops and says much about the British legacy of this city. and modern architecture too. Like Moses Mabida Stadium, a soccer stadium built for the World Cup in 2010 that has become an icon for the city. Outside the city, at the end of the 19th century, the British established the sugarcane industry in Durban. Farm owners had a difficult time attracting Zulu laborers to work on their plantations, so the British brought thousands of indentured laborers from India. Today, Durban is home to one of the largest concentrations of Indians outside of India. And so, to understand one of the true souls of the city, I went to Phoenix Settlement, the Indian heart of Durban. In Phoenix, I discovered this house, green, tiny, humble, the house of someone I've respected my whole life, and she was waiting for me there to explain the importance of this modest home. Ella Gandhi is a former member of parliament in South Africa, she is a peace activist who follows her grandfather's teachings closely. She told me how Gandhi's path of passive resistance started during the 20-year period he spent in South Africa. In 1904, Gandhi set up an ashram where he began his experiment of a life of simplicity and service and began his apprenticeship as a Mahatma, 
which means great soul. South Africa is one of the most important uh, areas in the development of Gandhiji's life. When he came here, he was 24 years old. And he came here with all the middle class values that he had, you know, been born with and grew up into. It was the 21 years that he lived here and he saw the conditions of the indentured workers, of the local people. And that's the reason why in 1904, he decided to establish the settlement. And the reason for the settlement was to, to move back to an agricultural sort of economy, to become self-sufficient, to begin to look at issues and how you can live close to nature, begin to look at environmental issues and at people and how you can help people. So this is what Gandhiji did in the settlement and that was the transformation and if you see his image when he came here with a suit and tie you know stiff collars and all of that and when he left here he was wearing just a little cloth and a, a long shirt that was visible transformation but in terms of his philosophy he had also transformed a great deal in South Africa. What do you think the rest of the world can learn from Durban? In Durban, people enjoy the richness of the different cultures. If all the countries in the world could do that, we could have you know, people respecting people because they are people and, and not because, you know, they belong to any particular group. She is still actively pursuing the dreams of her grandfather that are her dreams as well. The dream of nonviolence, the dream of preserving the environment and achieving the best that South Africa can be. My time in Durban has come to an end. While people around me enjoy the sea and the waterfront, I try to think about all the things I've learned in the city, all the people I have met. I think about the city's true spirit and what I'd be like if I had been born into this great melting pot. Durban is the spectrum of humanity. It's the, the raw Africa with the New Age Africa together. You hear Indian languages, you see them written, you have Indian food, you have Indian spices, but you're not in India, you're in Africa. And then you have the Zulu culture, which is so powerful. Um, it's the great tribe of Africa and this is the city where they're at. And the fact that you've put these two together, along with, you know, the British, <laughs> who were everywhere in the world, but they were really the minority in Durban. And again, these are such <laughs> discordant cultures, but somehow they've, they've connected, and somehow they've made peace with each other in a way that is funky, it's rich, it's fun. That's Durban. But when I left Durban, I felt like I left a part of myself there. <laughs>